Welcome to the Empire Builders podcast. Dave Young here with Stephen Semple. And, and uh, Stephen, we're diving into uh, more feminine territory for me. Like I, uh, you keep like triggering my relationship with my sisters when we talk about Barbie dolls and, and things like that. And now it's Clairol, yes. the, the beauty product. The, uh, I, I'm trying to even re- remember, like I should know this, right? I, I had three sisters and raised four daughters and uh, Claire all should be, you know, firmly entrenched in my vocabulary. I know it's a, a female beauty product line, hair, skin, makeup, that kind of stuff. All of it. So hair is the big one. That's the one we're going to talk about because that's basically right. the origin of Clairol was uh, dying hair. But, you know, I was thinking we almost need to, um, I almost need to pick one of these ones in the future and have your sisters on with you. I think that would be quite a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, please, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and I even have the title for the podcast, Dave Young Angsty. Angsty. <laughs> So Clairol's, you know, it's an old company. It was founded in 1931 by Joan and Lawrence Gelb and a business partner of theirs, James Romeo. And what they saw was this hair coloring preparation in France called Clairol. So it was already called Clairol and it was being done in France. So what they did is they co-founded the Clairol company to import products from France. Here's how big they got. And I don't know when it changed to them having the international rights and things along that lines. I, I, di- I didn't really go down uh, that rabbit hole, but give you an idea how big they got in 1957. So you're basically talking, you know, 26 years after they founded, they were sold to Bristol Myers. And then in 2004, they hit 1.6 billion in sales. And today they're under a company called Cotty which was acquired from P&G for $12.5 billion. So they became a a really big company in the space. But the thing that we don't realize is how revolutionary a product Clairol hair dye was because hair coloring at the time was Mm -hmm. very looked down upon. Like it was very frowned upon. And today it's really common. Like half of all American women between 13 and 75 color their hair. Right. Oh, and Dave, there's hope for you. It's becoming more popular with men as well. I believe that, and I've known men that do it. That I, I have a feeling, always believed that nobody knew they were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, they believed that. <laughs> well, see, for me, it's not even an option, because you have hair, I don't. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, you, you've got that white goatee. I've got a white goatee, and I've always, I, I've, uh, yeah, I agree. Honestly, I've always felt better gray than gone. Yeah, and and so uh, I'm thankful for for my flowing locks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Rub it in, rub it in. So anyway, uh, it's it is now becoming more popular with men. But as I said, it wasn't always. And a great example of this is in the 1950s. Betty Friedman wrote a book, The Feminine Mystique, and she mm. said there's three things women should not do: should not smoke in public. Now this had an impact in the cigarette business. Remember we talked about Marlboro where it originally mm-hmm. started off as a woman's cigarette and women's smoking declined and they pivoted to it being a men's cigarette. This book was influential enough. It had an impact on women smoking in public. Okay. The other thing women should not do is wear long pants unless under a coat and color her hair. Huh. Okay. These were the big three. Don't smoke in public. Don't wear long pants. Don't color your hair. Literally, the book goes on to say you are better to pull out a gray hair than risk association with dyeing your hair. Huh. There was also resistance to cosmetics at the time, but this was the backdrop. So this, we, And it's important to understand this backdrop because enter the Glebs, and Lawrence is a chemical broker and entrepreneur. He buys these rights to this French hair coloring product with this mm-hmm. backdrop, right? Now, what made Clairol also very unique is it didn't coat the hair. It actually penetrated it. And it created softer, more natural tones. It was also more like a shampoo, and it cleaned and conditioned the hair at the same time. Okay. Now, when it was introduced in World War II, it was a five-step process that lasted quite a long period of time. So it first of all started as this multi-step process. He took that process, and with seven years of research, it became a single step that could be done in 20 minutes. Hmm. Okay. And the results were more natural than anything you could get previously. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. It was so advanced, 
people didn't believe it. Good Housekeeping magazine would not accept their ads. It took three years for Good Housekeeping to accept their ads. And then at that point, they gave them the Good Housekeeping seal of approval. Good Housekeeping was like, yeah, we're not running this because we don't believe it works. <laughs> so, how do you get around that? Wouldn't you just like show up at their headquarters with, with some hair coloring? and? They started doing demonstrations. Like to your point, they did live demonstrations of dying people's hair at the International Beauty Show. And they literally would bring in these buckets and they would show people that it's just water. And it, like they did this very elaborate demonstration. Okay. Two professionals at the International Beauty Show and within six months of launch, salon visits to dye increased 500%. Like just, All right. So right? This, this, in, in, these, in these times, it was not a home product. It was something you went to a salon to... It originally was something you went to a salon, and even okay. when they first started advertising it, it was to salons. And there's an interesting thing I'm going to talk about when they pivoted to it being a home product. So okay. I want you to hold on to that thought and hold on to the 20 minutes that it took in a salon. But what we're talking about right now is is uh, a product that you made an appointment and, and went in and got your hair colored. Correct. But when they advertised this, they didn't advertise it to the salons. They advertised it to the consumer. Now, they had to get the salons to buy into it so that salons would offer it, and they had to get good housekeeping to buy into it so they would advertise it, right? But they created an advertising campaign to women, because also keep in mind, women were resistant to the idea, so they had to make it, Yeah, they, they had to make women open to it. So this campaign was created by Shirley Polykoff, and she's a self-professed, unsophisticated, first-generation American in her 20s. And when she pitched this idea, she admits that she actually pitched, and this is really interesting because I think a lot of customers don't realize agencies do this. She pitched three ideas, hoping two of them, Clara all would not take. Okay. Right? It's the classic, I'm going to pitch three and hope they take one. And in her book, does she or doesn't she, she admits the first two are what the industry calls knockdowns, ideas that they don't want the client to take. Like this is an industry-wide practice. So customers, when an agency comes to you with a bunch of ideas, why don't you just say to them, look, just show me the one you really believe in because the other two are probably <laughs> knockdowns. We don't do that, by the way. I hate it because the risk is, what if the customer picks the one we don't want? But anyway. Exactly, yeah. But she wanted to do something bold. And what she realized was she an arresting question is really bold. Does she or doesn't she? Yeah. That was the bold question. Now, that headline is kind of naughty, but... The picture is very nice. If you remember those Clairol pictures, it is a picture of, you know, a mature woman with her daughter. So it'd be mm. a mature woman with her daughter with this headline, does she or doesn't she, right? So it's that juxtaposition that made it powerful. It's the fit but doesn't fit that made it really powerful. And at first, Life Magazine would not run the ad because the men thought it was too sexual. But here's the thing is to women, it wasn't. And so they did a survey and what they found was like, yes, men saw it as sexual, but women didn't. For hmm. women, they had a very different meaning because of how they saw the picture. The men saw the headline, didn't see the picture. The women saw the picture of this mature woman with her daughter and it became intriguing. It was not expressing desire, but an expression of satisfaction with the result is how women saw it. So based on that, they were then able to get the ad run in Life magazine. Because Miss Clairol is a mother, not a love interest. Now, here's the other interesting place where they had pushback because the whole idea in the 50s, whole idea in the 50s of being an unwed mother would be really bad. So people want them to change it to Mrs. Clairol, but they like ah. the sound of Miss Clairol. So they okay. stuck with Miss Clairol. Miss Clairol is a mother, not a love interest. They used then a wedding ring in the ad to diffuse that pushback. So they made the wedding ring very prominent in the pictures. Gotcha. So they did all of these things that fit but don't fit, that create all of this intrigue that you and I know as advertisers really get people involved in it because the brain is doing all of these mm -hmm. all of these flips trying to figure it out. But here's also where they became very strategic. Originally, she wanted to do the idea, does she or doesn't she only hear mother knows for sure? But what they realized is because they're doing this through salons, it was, does she or doesn't she? Only her hairdresser knows for sure. Yeah, yeah. Right, so that then tied in the copy into professional and also implies professional endorsement. 
Mm -hmm. I actually did a Google image search for, for does she or doesn't she? And I, I would suggest the listener does that. It shows you all these magazine, these old magazine images from, from the days of this campaign. Yeah. Yeah. But it was very carefully crafted copy. Because the other thing, the early copy referred to it as automatic coloring. Now, mm. remember, in the 50s, things being automatic was new and innovative and desired. Automatic cars were coming out. So it was originally referred to as automatic coloring. Now, again, later they removed that terminology automatic. But when you look at the photos, the headline, the crafting of the copy, it was all very carefully done. In the first six years, uh, sales rose 413%. Mm. Okay. And this campaign is considered one of the most popular advertisements of all time. Then along comes the 1970s, and they had another breakthrough. They created a home version. Here's where things get interesting. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Hey, Rick, how's it going? Okay, fine. <laughs> that doesn't sound okay. Well, what is it? My business. What about it? You probably wouldn't understand. Hit me. Well, you know I love it. But? My revenues have flatlined, and I'm not growing anymore. Okay. Well... It's frustrating and depressing, and it was so much better when we were growing. Oh, I bet it was. And nothing I've tried has moved the needle. What about talking to Steven? Steven who? You know, the guy that hosts this podcast. Really? You think he could help? I hear he runs a paid-for-performance marketing agency. I wonder how that works. Why don't you ask him? How? Book one of those free starter sessions on the podcast website. I don't know. You can't say you've tried everything. If you don't try this. You're right. I might even learn something. I bet you do. Thanks, man. Let's go grab a bite. Yeah, sounds good. Right after you call Steven. Okay, okay. Book your starter session on this podcast website. Just visit theempirebuilderspodcast.com and click on Get Started. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. Going into the salon, it took 20 minutes, and women got used to it's a 20-minute process mm -hmm. right in the home instructions guess how long the instructions were for leaving the product in the hair well you hope it's about 20 minutes it was 20 minutes they kept it yeah. at 20 minutes even though it could be done in two minutes but you see they had experienced the problem that happens if somebody doesn't believe your product will work remember good housekeeping wouldn't run ads because they didn't believe the product worked Right, not that it was a bad product. So their concern was if we said to people you could do this in two minutes, they wouldn't believe it. So they kept it to the 20 minutes. The home product, they said, leave it in for 20 minutes. Is that still true today? You know, that's a great question. I didn't look up whether today it's still a 20 minute process or whether it's a two minute process. I don't know. This was the 1970s. So we're talking 50 years ago. The chemical composition may have changed and it may be something that now requires 20 minutes because if you're creating something, 20 minutes is not a barrier, right? So who knows? But what I do know is when they launched it in 1970, it required two minutes, yeah. but they decided to keep the instructions at 20 because of the comfort of this being a 20 minute process, leaning yeah. into what's comfortable. It's a lot like the Betty Crocker thing about, uh, you know, you let the consumer add the egg and the oil. Yes. Then they feel like they're baking a cake as opposed to just dumping the box in and mixing it with water. Absolutely. Yeah. And I really, really commend Clairol for seeing that and recognizing yeah. that and understanding that from their history. There's a reason why this campaign is one of the most popular, most successful campaigns of all time is because how carefully it's crafted. And I think a lot of people don't realize great campaigns aren't, they aren't banged out in a minute, mm -hmm. right? There was a lot of thought, headline, photo supporting the headline, the ring on the finger supporting this, mm -hmm. keeping the Miss Clairol because it's a little bit, you know, strange in things like automatic coloring. There was just a lot of very careful and deep thought put into every word of this campaign, yeah. which yeah. is why it was so successful why it was so mm -hmm. deeply, deeply successful. So there was a couple of lessons that came out of this. And one is be that thoughtful in your advertising. It's amazing how often it's like, oh, I got this thing coming up. And, you know, somebody calls, you know, from, you know, your whoever advertiser. Okay, we got to change the ad this week. What do we want to do? And it's banged out in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. This was not banged out in 10 minutes. Yeah. The work that we do is not banged out in 10 minutes. 
things. Like it's amazing how much of a difference that makes. That's one lesson. But the other one is it would be easy for them to go, especially in the early days before there was the home coloring thing to go, salons are our customers. So that's who we need to market to. How yeah. often do we see that? Target the customer. Like how often is it target the customer? Well, if you were targeting the customer on this, you would have targeted salons. Yeah. But what they knew is the target's not salons. The target is the woman. If she walks into the salon wanting it, guess what the salon's going to do? They're going to order it. They're going to freaking order it. This is the same thing Wrigley did. Like, you go back to yes. what was that, episode one? <laughs> <laughs> it was single digits. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it was an early one. Like you yes. uh, sampling and, and the, those kinds of things, but you directly target the consumers, even though you can't buy the product directly from the company. So you trigger the consumer to walk into a store to ask for it. Yes. Yes. And we've seen this over and over again. We've mm -hmm. seen this over and over again where it's market to the consumer. And it's funny, there's a buzzword today in business and they seem to think it's so new. Well, we're a direct to consumer marketing. That makes us so yeah. unique. It's like, shut the hell up and sit down. It ain't new. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, recognize targeting is not always what you should be doing. Sometimes the issue is not to target your customer, but to target your customer's influence. Exactly. Indirect targeting. We yes. I like to call it targeting with, with message as opposed to targeting with demographics and, and media. Yeah. You target by what you say. Absolutely. And so to me, it really jumped out. And also what was also interesting was the backdrop that they were like, the other reason why I think this is seen as one of the most popular advertisements of all time is how often have we seen an ad that has actually been able to adjust the sensibilities of the public? That was a big uphill battle, mm, mm -hmm. right? When you consider that backdrop, you know, that's really interesting. And then leaning into it with a question like, does she or doesn't she, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it was bold. It was bold. Hats off to them. I actually, it's funny. I always knew it was a good campaign. After researching this, it's like a freaking great campaign. Yeah. Great campaign. Yeah. It works so well and still, right? It established this, I don't know, tradition, but but acceptability. Yes. Of dyeing your hair, right? Yes, Coloring it did. your hair. And maybe I should go get some hair color. Oh, you'd be great as a redhead there, Dave. You know, I'm... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was actually thinking of, of like, if I did it, it'd probably be some unnatural color. Like, it'd yes. be blue. Yeah. Like, granny blue. Right. Like, there you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for bringing Miss Claire all to the podcast, Stephen. Yeah, I knew you would like the story just because the more you look into it, the more you realize just how, how powerful the messaging was. In. And, and I think we're okay just leaving my sisters right where they are. Conversation to be continued. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast. Dot com.